Next up, we have Riley, who you guys all already know uh, from when she helped us host earlier today. <laughs> it's good to be back, and thank you for, <laughs> for uh, <laughs> my technical difficulties to start with. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> We're all having fun adventures with technology and microphone pickup. <laughs> this stream is no stranger to technical difficulties. I mean, what better time to, like, learn to fly a plane than when you're flying it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Look, we put this entire weekend together in five days. I don't want to hear. <laughs> and you've raised a lot for a cause that needs yeah. it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Doing it. Woo. Donate. Uh, is that a uh, Calendodromius I see as a, a, an icon there? Yeah, uh, Rip, my friend who, Ripley drew our Kalinda persona that we use for a dad drinking uh, uh, soda with sunglasses. Mm -hmm. And I, I use it for everything. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. My birds want to be let out of the cage, but they can't right now. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I, I had a Teddy cameo. <laughs> he may appear again. Why lizards are easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, really? Uh, full disclosure, my fiance is cooking, which is why they can't come out, because there's open flame. <laughs> they don't understand that, <laughs> because they're tiny dinosaurs that live in my house. <laughs> they remember, they, they've got no. <laughs> Tens of millions of years of being dinosaurs in their collective memory. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, so how's everyone? starting to come in for the next one. Yeah. How, uh, how's everyone's day been so far? <laughs> Went on a good hike this morning. That's good. And Yay! <laughs> Not too sore. That's what all the plastic wrap is about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. I guess I could introduce Riley officially now, um, or should I wait till we technically are supposed to start in three minutes? <laughs> Any time you like. Yeah. Here you go. Uh, um. So Riley Black is the author of Skeleton, Skeleton Keys, My Beloved Brontosaurus, and other philosopherous books. Um, over the past decade, she's done fieldwork across Western North America and has written for publications from Nature to Slate. Um, and she is based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Yeah, it's me. Yeah. And uh, this, this evening, I was about to say afternoon, but it's not really afternoon for almost anybody. Mm -hmm. This evening. Be talking about uh, my good friend Allosaurus a little bit. Yay! Oh. I, I have uh, a PowerPoint presentation that I'll try and pull up, and then after that, I'm going to have a little bit of uh, assistance talking a little bit of, about uh, Allosaurus anatomy, which should be pretty fun. So let me let me see if I hit the buttons in the right order. <laughs> uh, uh, Yeah. All right, does that seem to be working? You should all be looking at uh, yep. Yep. Okay, great. So this presentation, I put it together for uh, the Dinosaur Mu Journey Museum in Fruta, Colorado a couple of weeks ago. But I thought I'd bring it back here just because Allosaurus is a favorite of mine, like, like many other paleo people. I think I started off uh, just following that late Cretaceous <laughs> poll where it's like, oh, Tyrannosaurs are so cool and Ceratopsids are so cool. <laughs> After I did, uh, and, and please feel free to interrupt me with like, questions, comments, or anything as we go. Like, I, I want this to be conversational, not just Riley talks at you for an hour. <laughs> um, but I did some field work in the Morrison Formation working with uh, Peterson from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and John Warnock from NIU. 
And it really got me into the Morrison Formation because I really thought for a long time, okay, most of these dinosaurs were named, you know, over a century ago. We, they've been, you know, they're in multiple papers. We know a fair bit about their anatomy and their relationships and things like that. You know, is there really all that much new to the Morrison? And I didn't really turn it around and think that, like, wait, it's really kind of awesome that we have such a great sample size of these animals that we've known them for so long. We know so many of the other animals that they lived with, you know, so many sites. It's kind of like if somebody, you know, tells you Edmontosaurus is a, you know, a lame dinosaur, or like Dicynodon's like Lystrosaurus, like, ah, oh, it's just so boring. It's like, no, it's really cool that we have so much of this particular animal. And Allosaurus in particular really just got my attention. I love carnivores, you know, with big scary teeth and, and claws and all that stuff. And it really just struck me how much this dinosaur was living in the shadow of Tyrannosaurus for basic, you know, not its entire history because it was named first, which I'll get to in a moment. But it's always been thought of like, oh, well, it's, it's another big carnivore, but it's not as cool as T-Rex. So this is, this is my effort to show you otherwise. It would be a lot more Allosaurus appreciation <laughs> out there in the world. This is uh, a mount of a juvenile specimen a composite from some of the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Aquarium material here in Utah, uh, the mount at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And it's real, this is a great place where you can have fun with museum lights, which I always love doing, seeing if you can get that spotlight through the eye socket and really kind of bring it to life a little bit. So I think just I have a couple of figures in this presentation, but almost everything else are photos from Allosaurus at various museums. So where do we really start off with this dinosaur? Well, you know, indigenous people, definitely found their bones. Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Corps itself was known to local people and word got passed to ranchers and then got passed to paleontologists. So, you know, this is we've been finding Allosaurus bones for a long time, but Allosaurus as we know it, what we call Allosaurus, goes back to 1877. And that's when, this is the height of the bone wars between Othniel Charles March, based out of New Haven and Yale, and uh, Edward Drinker Cope out of Philadelphia. There are other figures involved in this tussle as well, but those were the two guys, the two basically cantankerous, I probably shouldn't use a word that I want to use on a PG stream, but very grumpy men who were vying with each other to name as many dinosaurs as they possibly could, as quickly as they possibly could. And this gives you an idea of what some of those descriptions were like. So this is the actual original description for Allosaurus fragilis. If you write species descriptions now and do dinosaur systematics, um, I don't know whether you think this is a good thing or you want to go back to this and what is so concise. This is really all that was known of that animal to start out, that it was you know, this collection of partial skeleton, this associated group of remains that involves some vertebrae and some limb bones and enough to tell that this was something that Marsh hadn't seen before. It was something new and it got its species named Fragilis from having that appearance of likeness to the vertebrae. Um, but that's what really what Allosaurus means. It translates literally to different lizard. Uh, so it's this, you know, if you imagine it, animal stalking across the Morris ecosystem, uh, you know, the, the apex predator of its time. And you ask, you know, somebody, oh, what's an animal called? It's, you know, it, it means different lizard. That's it. Just, we you know, it was different. That's it. If it were named now, I can only imagine the titles we'd come up for. But that's really, really where Allosaurus got its start. Since that time, we've been actually very, very fortunate with the Allosaurus remains that we found. I'm going to go into the species in a minute or two, but in terms of skeleton representations, in terms of complete skulls, there are multiple individuals from this animal across the four corners area of the U.S. and expanding, expanding a little bit further from that. This is a mount at the uh, Naturalist Museum of Los Angeles, NLA. Uh, the actual skull, the complete skull is on display in a glass case near this mount. It's one of the most gorgeous dinosaur skulls that I've ever seen. I'm surprised that people don't know it better. And it's just one of several that we have for Allosaurus. So this isn't like, okay, we've got a bit of maxilla here and we've got a piece of leg there and we have some claws and stuff. We can kind of cobble together an image of this animal. We have a good idea of what this animal look like, how it grew, what its growth cycles were. Um, I'm going to get into some of that as, as I go through this, but this is just an example of just like how well represented this animal is. And that's really important for determining paleobiology. You know, it's really cool when we get a new dinosaur, but oftentimes those are very fragmentary skeletons. They are 
be one of a kind, basically. There's some dinosaurs I'm sure we all know of. They're named basically from a bit of jaw, and that's about it. Uh, and I think it's really amazing that we have dozens of this carnivore. Carnivores are supposed to be rare. There's actually a uh, book of the famous in ecology called Big Fierce Animals Are Rare, relating to food webs and why you have you know, more grass than herbivores and more herbivores than car carnivores. It's really kind of astounding that we have so much Allosaurus from the Morrison Formation and from equivalent formations in Europe. So we do get Allosaurus uh, on the Iberian Peninsula from about the same time as the Western US, but most finds, the bulk of what we know about this animal comes from the Four Corners area of the US and a little bit further on. Depending on what you call some of these animals, the occurrence of Allosaurus in some spots in New Mexico and Oklahoma might be debated. Some people call those animals Surophaganax and think they're a larger, closely related version. Uh, I, I don't think so. I think that they're Allosaurus. But this gives you an idea that yellow on that gray is more or less a rough approximation of the extent of the Morrison Formation in the United States. So this is that this ecosystem between 155 to 145 million years ago, where you have those classic dinosaur faunas of Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, like really so many of our favorites come from these places. And on this little plus signs are different localities in which Allosaurus has turned up. And there are even more than this. These are just some of the most famous ones. Uh, so it really is an animal that we know of from many different places at a pretty wide range that we've got a lot of. And that in a way was kind of a problem in that especially during the Bone Wars era, where Cope and Marsh and others were racing each other to name as new dinosaurs as possible. If you found anything that didn't correspond to a skeleton you already knew of or published or had, um, or you really just wanted to show up your rival, you could take almost anything and name a new dinosaur genus or species based on it. This is uh, a jaw from an animal that was called Labrosaurus. And uh, it's a broken, Allos a bit of broken Allosaurus jaw. If you saw a uh, dinosaur evolution, that broke jaw Allosaurus that gets totally hit in the face with the sauropod whiplash tail. It's based upon this animal from what my recollection is. And we now know that it is in fact Allosaurus. But at the time, this pathological jaw was saying, oh, this is something different. I'm just gonna give it a new name, file it away, onto the next thing. It kind of made a bit of a mess. So under Allosaurus, if you search for it in you know, a dinosaur encyclopedia or even on Wikipedia, you can see all these synonyms that were named for over time, and that took a little bit of straightening out. Uh, I mentioned Sorophaganax a minute ago. This is uh, a mount of one of those specimens at the uh, in New Mexico in Albuquerque at the New Museum of uh, Natural History and Science uh, with an animal that we used to call Seismosaurus, and now we know is a larger species of, of Diplodocus. So Sorophaganax, it seemed to be a, an Allosaur, and I think an Allosaurus, that's getting up to almost T-Rex size. So this is you know, an above average Allosaurus in some of what we see. Where that fits systematically, if this is a new species or really can be folded into Allosaurus fragilis, I don't really know if that's been resolved yet, but you can see just looking at it that like whatever differences it has in that population of animals, it's really not all that significant. So, you know, from the time the Allosaurus was born, you know, an egg about the size of a grapefruit, some of them, you know, would average out about 25 to 30 feet long. Some of them got a bit larger than that. But this is really the most common large carnivorous dinosaur in the Morrison Formation. If you go in the Morrison Formation and you find, you know, the, the remains of any mid-sized to large carnivorous dinosaur, nine times out of ten, it's going to be Allosaurus. But how do these specimens relate to each other? Uh, I mentioned before, we have all these names that have turned out to be synonyms. Well, we have you know, the famous Allosaurus fragilis, that was the first one named, but that occurs in what we call the brushy basin number of the Morrison. So towards the end of Morrison time, based the those latter you know, four to five million years. If you go down a level, basically earlier than Allosaurus fragilis, you get Allosaurus dumansoni. So this is Big Al, Big Al two a couple of other specimens that have been found. And this is a much more slender animal. It's been known for, um, you know, since its discovery in the uh, mid nineties, it only just got named, thank God, this, this year. So we can finally really talk about it um, as well as it should be. But this is an animal that 
seemed much more svelte, much more slender. It wasn't as bulked out as uh, Allosaurus fragilis is. And then across the Atlantic on the Iberian Peninsula, we have uh, a European species of Allosaurus. We don't have a complete look at it yet, but it seems consistent with Allosaurus. This doesn't seem to be another example of you know, finding a dinosaur distantly and saying, okay, well, it's a theropod and it lives at this kind of same time. Uh, there are sites like Tendaguru in uh, Tanzania where some remains there were traditionally named after Morrison theropods, but it turns out um, that there's something different. This is a case where this really does just seem to be Allosaurus in this habitat that's far away from the Morrison formation. Why that is is still being resolved, but this is how it stands now. These are the three what are considered valid species of Allosaurus. And for our purposes, for most of what I'm going to be talking about, you have Allosaurus gymnatsoni and that salt wash member that's a bit older. And then right after they have Allosaurus fragilis, which is an animal you see the back of the skull start to widen out. I've got my little model here. If you look at it head on, let's see if I can orient it right. It's not quite doing the T-Rex thing where it's like all the way out here, but it's a bit bulkier at the back of the skull that they're adding on more jaw closure, closure musculature. Um, the animal's doing a little bit, something a little bit different than it did previously. And here's a, a photograph of an Allosaurus fragilis at the uh, Utah Field House of Natural History out, uh, outside Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. And this is really the classic animal. This is what we think of when we think of Allosaurus proper, you know, stalking a stegosaurus or trying to eat baby apatosaurus like their popcorn. This is the animal that really set the image for what this dinosaur is. So what do we know about its biology? Well, I love this reconstruction of uh, Allosaurus facing off against a, uh, an adult barosaurus trying to protect its, uh, its baby. You can kind of see it right at the bottom, just that little head poking up. I doubt confrontations like this happened all that often. Um, if we think about the way sauropods and other dinosaurs reproduced, it was relatively similar to sea turtles, uh, as far as I can tell from current hypotheses, that they laid a whole bunch of eggs. You know, maybe they had some amount of guarding those nests, but possibly not. It was more of what we call lay them and leave them strategy. And I believe it's John Foster and other folks who basically called those baby sauropods uh, Jurassic popcorn that when these babies would hatch, they'd flood the ecosystem. And we know from other dinosaur species and studies over life histories that that first year for most dinosaurs was incredibly brutal, that the population would just crash. Basically, you'd have all these babies, but very few would make it past through that first year. And carnivorous dinosaurs like Allosaurus were part of that. But there are a couple of other ideas. For example, when you get a large sauropod like Barosaurus or like Diplodocus or Apatosaurus, that's you know, multiple tons of meat out on the landscape. So if that dinosaur passes away from injury, from disease, from old age, whatever it is, that's another smorgasbord. And there's an idea, unfortunately, I don't think there's a great way to test it as yet. Uh, you probably have to look for wounds on sauropod bones that have since healed and find them in multiple places. But there's this idea, I think it's attributed to Greg Paul, I might be wrong on that. But that Allosaurus was uh, what we call a flesh grazer that was basically running up to sauropods, taking this big, you know, we know it's, it could open its jaws to about 90 degrees or so, just taking this big bite out of it and running away. You have a meal. It's kind of like the way that white sharks attack uh, elephant seals, but without finishing the job, that they kind of harvest these sauropods in a way. So it's a, it's a pretty neat idea, uh, but that's not how do we actually test it. But whatever Allosaurus was doing, it was actually really successful at it. We find it much greater abundance than Ceratosaurus, which is found in many of the same quarries, and much, much greater abundance than Torvosaurus, which is a larger animal, but not found in quite so many places. And that we actually don't have a great single skeleton for, and we don't know whether these reasons have to do with competition or these other animals like Ceratosaurus and Torvosaurus were living in more upland environments and then coming in. Um, that's something that has yet to be answered, but for whatever reason, Allosaurus was the carnivorous dinosaur through most of the Morrison formation and feeding on animals like Camptosaurus as well. I just kind of love this mount from the uh, Royal Terrell Museum in Alberta because it kind of has a, hey, it tickles kind of aspect to it. So what about the social lives of these dinosaurs? Uh, there are places like Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, which I've done field work 
for the uh, past, I think, five years now, which are out there this summer. Um, but unfortunately, we're all, we're all still in lockdown as well. We should be. But in that place, we have dozens of Allosaurus specimens of all different ages from yearling through mature adult in the same place. And this is the only quarry that is like this. Most Morrison Formation quarries, you find a lot of herbivorous dinosaurs, a lot of Camarasaurus, a lot of Patasaurus, things like that. Um, you don't find all that many carnivores, and that fits with what we know about the ecology of these animals, that you, know, you can't have more carnivores than you have herbivores unless the carnivores are eating each other. I know that's a hypothesis for some uh, Triassic ecosystems. Whatever's going on at Cleveland Lloyd is kind of strange, and it can't necessarily be used as an example of um, pack hunting behavior or sociality. Uh, we have these little glimmers that really only bring up more questions. So, for example, this is the Allosaurus fragilis mount, uh, you know, the, the neotype for, the, for this animal uh, that's been totally cleaned up, reconstructed, put in this new post. And the reason it has its tail around these eggs is based upon a, web, uh, a uh, site out in Wyoming where there are Allosaurus eggs and there are little embryonic Allosaurus bits and pieces in there. Do nesting grounds like that have something to do with the Cleveland Lloyd mystery? We don't really know that. That's one hypothesis. That's one that I particularly favor because it would make sense why you have multiple animals in the small area. But we, we, when we look at that site in particular, what we see is multiple events. And this is the work that Joe Peterson and John Warnock and their colleagues have done you know, over the past number of years where this was not a predator trap. It was not a place where Dinosaurs just dried, died of drought and then got covered up. It was a place where you had multiple events happening season after season where Allosaurus would die somewhere on the landscape during the dry season, probably. And then during the wet season, regardless of what else happened, those rainwaters would basically flood through the local channels. They would spill over into this mucky pond, basically. That was just full of this gross dinosaur soup. I can only imagine what the smell would have been like. It was mostly full of Allosaurus. So you just have these layers of these animals in one spot. So we don't know why so many are in this one spot, but we do know that they were there and that something unusual was going on. There are other cores where we find multiple Allosaurus specimens as well, but we're still kind of correlating what all those mean to each other. And this is what you see when you drive up to uh, Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry. Now they have this kind of Jurassic Park gate with a couple of snarling Allosaurus on the outside. And I just do that in there because I think it's kind of fun. And it's good to see some of that dinosaur as well, that not everything is a T-Rex all the time. So we know that these were predatory animals. We have bitten bones, we have tooth mark bones. There's actually just an awesome study that came out a couple of weeks ago from my Gap Moore Quarry, uh, just on the other side of the Utah border in uh, Fruita, Colorado. Uh, finding multiple bite marks, a high incidence of bite marks in this quarry, many of them attributed to Allosaurus, some of them on Allosaurus bones themselves. So we have an idea, you know, beyond the teeth and the claws, we have evidence of the on the bones that these were actively carnivorous animals. They also scavenged, they also likely cannibalized each other. And life was hard, and we know that life was hard in addition to all that predatory evidence from the injuries that Allosaurus carried. Many Allosaurus skeletons have some kind of pathology on this. is from the tail section of the mount at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And you can see there how a couple of those vertebrae have fused together and the chevron is fused to those vertebrae on the bottom. I don't know what that pathology was caused by, uh, whether it was some kind of bacterial infection, whether it was bone cancer, whether it was an injury that caused this fusion, but that's just one of many that you'll find. If you look at, you know, famously the big owl specimen, which I think, uh, Alex Hastings mentioned earlier during uh, their talk that I think that specimen has around 17 pathologies on just that one alone, from broken ribs to infected toe bones. These animals had a pretty rough life. That you know, this was something that they were actively pursuing um, their prey items and you know having a, a kind of tough time in the process. And here's another classic uh, Allosaurus fragilis mount. That's at the uh, University of I think Eastern Utah Museum, uh, the prehistoric museum out in, in Price near where Cleveland Lloyd is. So what does this all lead to? Well, we know quite a bit about what a horse's brain looked like and that we have a skull, the back of the skull from Cleveland Lloyd dinosaur where they got infilled with sediment. 
and it gives us the shape of the brain so we know it had a large olfactory bulb. We get an idea that could only hear low frequency sounds based upon the anatomy of that inner ear. We know that it could throw its jaw open wide. We know that it didn't quite have the crunching power of Tyrannosaurus rex, but it might not have needed to do that. This was a different kind of predatory dinosaur. In terms of its sociality, we haven't really resolved what that looked like yet. Uh, it's relatively hard to without something like a track site or skeletons found in a particular kind of association. But what I love about Allosaurus, this is an animal that has, you know, this great fossil record, dozens of skeletons, and we sell so many of these essential questions to ask, like so many questions that we ask about other dinosaur species. We can use those same techniques on Allosaurus as well and get a better idea of how it fit into its Morrison environment because the Morrison is really quite strange. Uh, the diversity is relatively high of all these large herbivorous dinosaurs, all these large sauropod dinosaurs living on the same landscape. You have multiple large predators, you have multiple small predators, you have oddballs like Stegosaurus shuffling around. Whatever was going on in this ecosystem, we don't really have an equivalent today. So as much as I love to focus on this one species itself, that's to me the most fascinating part of this is that Allosaurus might be the key, or at least one key, to figuring out how this ancient ecosystem worked. Uh, so, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead, Simon. Henry. I'm oh, sorry, I uh, hate to interrupt, but uh, there are these there are these kind of big gray rectangles on the uh, on the screen share. Okay. That's like a there's one in the middle. There's one kind of in the middle of the of the screen share. I don't know. Oh, let me see. Did oh, the, yeah, that worked. Okay, yeah, I was trying to give me a message. And I mean, the good news is that I'm done with my screen sharing for now because I'm about to call in my assistant, someone who can help me with a little bit of Allosaurus anatomy. <laughs> Metro, would you mind giving me a hand? Oh my God. <laughs> so this is Retro the Allosaurus, and we're going to go over a little bit of Allosaurus anatomy. Now, Retro, you're an Allosaurus for jealous, right? Right. So 150 million years, 145, give or take. Yeah, since the time that your ancestors were around. But you, so you're an evolved Allosaurus for jealous. Yes, absolutely. So one of the ways that you can tell Allosaurus from other predatory dinosaurs is when you look at the skull. So on Metro, those have kind of migrated forward a little bit, you know, looking a little bit kind of T-Rex-like there. But on Allosaurus for jealous way back when, you'd have what we call these lacrimal horns that are in front of the eye. So this is important if you ever want to draw an Allosaurus, get those eyes behind that horn there. Now, Retro, what do you think about basically jaw range? Like opening up, like these, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good effort, but it's not, not quite as impressive as the old one. So based upon some biomechanical size, I'm so sorry. You'll get there with practice. <laughs> but we know that Allosaurus for jealous could swing its jaws open about 90 degrees. And that's kind of neat because part of the hypothesis about how these dinosaurs went after their prey and fed was that they used their skulls kind of like a hatchet in a way that they'd throw their mouths wide open and use all that really impressive neck musculature. Yep. Yeah, to basically <laughs> throw their upper jaw at whatever it was they were going to bite and then close it. Now, granted, some of that research was done on Allosaurus gymnasii, the much more spelt. Allosaurus. It might be a little bit different than Allosaurus for jealous. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to get these names out. Because for years and years and years and years, we just had Allosaurus. Every specimen was just Allosaurus. But now that we have these multiple species, we can start to track the evolution of these animals. Now, on your hand retro, how many claws you got? Three. Right. So much like your ancestors, I mean, you could kind of turn your claw around for a little bit of a grip there, but that's another way to tell Allosaurus apart from some of our other dinosaurian friends that they've got relatively large, for a big theropod, arms with that big thumb claw and those two smaller hand claws. And, you know, unlike T-Rex, we just have basically the thumb and the first finger. The real question is why? We learned earlier today in some of our other streams that dinosaurs were clappers and not slappers, right? I mean, you can do both. But, you know, for Allosaurus, you wouldn't actually see, I think this is the, the Papo model that, you know, many of us know and love. You can see those broken wrists kind of hanging down, that these should be facing each other. And that allows for that prey cap capture grip. 
But when Allosaurus went to use those way back in the Jurassic heyday, it couldn't really see what it was looking at. It couldn't really like grab something with its hands and see at the same time. I wrote an article for Smithsonian about this a couple of years ago based on a conversation with Mike Habib about just, it's so weird to have the biomechanics of these arms where in a way, Tyrannosaurus and Carnosaurus, they, or Carnotaurus, they make more sense and that their arms are almost vestigial or relatively small. They might be powerful, but they're not really doing much in terms of prey capture. Allosaurus, you've got these big, you know, relatively powerful looking arms, and yet they don't seem like they were really well used for that purpose. So it's a matter of why. Why amongst the Allosaurus, whether it's um, you know, Allosaurus itself or some of its relatives, like Acrocanthosaurus, why they had these relatively large arms. And of course, if we're looking at Retro, you see these very fancy, I'm pointing to your teeth, <laughs> these very fancy recurved serrated teeth. And much like other dinosaurs, um, you know, Allosaurus replaced teeth throughout its entire life. I forget the, what the rate is. Mike Demick recently had a, and his group had a paper out about this. Um, I, wanted to, I want to say that it was about every 100 days or so that they would replace each tooth position. So I always kept a pretty sharp cutting edge in the recurve so that if you're prey, if you're something that uh, a dinosaur like Retro might want to eat, that you can't really go forward if the teeth are pointing backward. And speaking of hunting and senses, I mentioned the olfactory bulb. So on Retro, you can see that big nose. I'm sure all by now we're all familiar with the concept of uh, putting those nostrils at the front of the nasal cavity on the outside of the dinosaur that would have looked relatively small. But Allosaurus, all the same, had a relatively powerful sense of smell. This dinosaur could smell things from a long way off, pick up relatively small concentrations of those delicious carrion, <laughs> um, basically scents out, out on the air, and, and find prey on these open floodplain type landscapes. Really, to me, it's surprising how long Allosaurus species survive, that you find them throughout much of the Morrison, you know, millions upon millions of years, but also that the dinosaur didn't persist. We don't know why Allosaurus as it was went extinct. I know it's a bummer. Well, I mean, leaving you as an exception. Um, so that I think was about all the Allosaurus presentation that I had planned for the moment. And I'm happy to chat and take questions. We would all like to say we are honored that an Allosaurus has time traveled to support Black Lives Matter. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. It is amazing. Just, Retro was just hiding. Retro is very good at hide and seek. <laughs> oh, we do have a few backlog of Riley questions. But I think <laughs> and I saw has... some of them coming in, so I wanted to make sure I left enough time. <laughs> I think I have to let Henry ask them because I'm not going to be able to stop laughing for a while. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, I just wanted to be clear that, like, I, I know I did get called out for being a furry early on the stream. It's like, well, call me a furry. This is what you're going to get. <laughs> this is a furry accepting space. Absolutely. We, we call out anyone who judges furries. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. All right. Let me take it away. Uh, first question. Uh, have you faced any significant hurdles as a trans woman involved in paleontology and science communication, be that among professionals, peers, the general public, et cetera? Yeah. Um, it's been an interesting ride. I, I know for my part that I do, um, I retain a certain amount of privilege and that I, I built my career. Uh, before I came out. Um, sometimes I think about what my life would be like if I came out first and then had to build a career and what that would have been like. And I think it would have been much harder. Still, I think in general, the paleo community has been very welcoming. Um, I was really heartened to see like when I came out because I didn't do a big announcement. I just basically started living as, as Riley, living as myself, that a number of people that I knew were already behind me, you know, uh, voice their support made me feel welcome. Um, you know, not everybody has shown that same response, but I think it's been overwhelmingly positive. And this is still relatively new to me. I really, I started on hormone replacement therapy and I came out as a, a trans woman last year. Um, that field season was my first, but at the time those changes hadn't really started happening yet. I hadn't put a lot of effort into 
changing my gender expression or my appearance yet. So, so many people, I still look like a cisgender man or that I might be an eccentric man or something like that. And it made things a little bit difficult. For example, I was out in the field um, in June of last year, just about a year ago, uh, in the Pilot Mountains, we're doing some Triassic marine field work, uh, looking for Shonosaurus, these big whale-sized ichthyosaurs. And the place that we picked, there was a little bit of a spring there, and the guy who owned the water rights to that spring came up and he, you know, said hi and everything. And he starts talking about, you know, who he is, and he asks us who we are, and we're chatting. And then he starts going on this racist and homophobic rant against people in Nevada that he doesn't like, and all the people up in the Capitol Arena that he doesn't like. And I moved away because I was feeling very, very uncomfortable. And you know, eventually he left. And I was talking to one of the PIs in the group. I said, you know, that it makes me worry. I'm out here camping basically on what this guy considers his property. And he was, you know, not only just being awful, but he was mentioning how he keeps a gun in his truck and all that kind of stuff. And I, I was feeling a little bit worried, especially since I was recently out as a trans person. Uh, in fact, like on that trip, I like brought my first, like, I don't want this to be too much. Just give you an idea of where I was. Like I had brought like, sports bras out because that had started to change and you know I'd be wearing them under my shirts and I knew I was wondering how people would react to me how things would react differently and the PI just said like well how's he going to know which was basically you still look like a cisgender man so why should you be worried and that to me spoke to the amount of work that remains to be done for people like me in the field um but I say of the communities that I'm within, I think paleontology in general has been much more supportive and outspokenly so than, for example, the science communication community, the science writer community, which I spend a lot of time in. And I don't know whether that's a matter of isolation or um, it's a personal issue or what. So I think overall things are going well, but I am kind of aware and I try and think about like, okay, part of the reason I'm able to do what I did was because I really proved myself um, to the community under this one presentation. But if I had transitioned when I really wanted to or had done that earlier, this trajectory might've been very, very different. So I wanna leave the door much more open to people like younger people who were like I was at, at younger ages and then not have to go through this pressure of not feeling they can be who they are. So I won't say that I've like faced very active um, discrimination or consequences, but there's still a layer of unease, you know, like, I don't know what to call you. Like, out of a field site last year, I had to explain to a student, like, why it is not a proper term to call a trans person. So I think a lot of things aren't necessarily overtly toxic, per se, in an intentional way, but there's a lot of education that needs to be done. Absolutely. As a felt trans person, agreed. <laughs> But 100%. Um, what's the next question, Henry? The next question of what do you predict the next big scientific revelation about dinosaurs will be? Something we never thought we'd find out. Wow. I mean, if I had that, I'd just make it the subject of my next book and write that book. <laughs> um, oh, T Teddy's chiming in because now we're in here. So Teddy and Jet have decided to, to join us. Um, the next big discovery about dinosaurs is, I mean, this is a difficult thing because I, I think we grow up listening to a lot of these stories of big discoveries, right? That we have the bone wars that we think of Charles Darwin on the origin of species. And that's probably the reason why like, we're having this event today because so much of the story is just it's the same group of white guys controlling everything. We don't put the emphasis on community science and how like a community allowed this to, you know, these revelations to be made, this, the science to go forward. I'm not sure that there's gonna be a singular dinosaur discovery that really like, changes everything for us. I think the picture of dinosaurs that we're getting um, is getting better and better over time. There's certainly some big questions that remain to be resolved, but I'm not sure there's gonna be any one fossil that really does it. I'd say dinosaur in physiology is the big one. It's gonna be variable as well. Like I think during the 70s and 80s, there's that big debate and this, and I was growing up, I was born in 1983. So the dinomania of the 80s and 90s was with me and you know, seeing the same people on every documentary talk about, you know, were dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded and that debate really was kind of the context 
of where I started. And I think it's still relatively unresolved, not in, in terms of dinosaurs being cold-blooded. We, you know, we all agree that they're active animals. They seem to have elevated metabolisms. They're growing at a very fast rate. But it's just like, what was the physiological mechanism that allowed that to happen? And how did it differ from species to species? Because talking about dinosaur physiology as a monolith, you might as well talk about mammal physiology as a monolith. And there are some mammals that, you know, hibernate or it can slow down their metabolisms at, at certain times. And there's something like they all run differently. So I think to me, that would be the most fascinating thing that would really give us a lot more insights into, you know, how much did a dinosaur have to eat in a day? How fast could they move? It'll have implications for so much of their biology, where if we could start to figure out those pieces, if not species by species, then family by family or subgroup by subgroup, that would really give us a much better picture of how these animals behaved. But I think, you know, short of that, one of my favorite memories from uh, SVP, uh, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meetings from a couple of years ago was the unveiling of Dinochirus, right? Like I was there in the room during that session. And it was amazing because we all grew up with this dinosaur. We all grew up with the big arms uh, and wondering what they belonged to. And it was generally agreed that this was a big ornithomimus. So if you take something like an ornithomimus or a gallimimus, you just blow it up to kind of T-Rex size. That's still pretty rad. But the actual animal with that duckbill-like face and the kind of pygostyle type tail anatomy and the sail on its back and just how much weirder it was than anybody could have ever expected. Like the room gasped when that walking animation came up on the screen. And that was just such a magical moment. And I'm sure we're doing for a lot more. For example, just to pick another similar animal, we still don't know what most of Therizinosaurus looks like. We, we have an arm and there are some other parts uh, from what I understand, but we don't have a complete picture of the animal. And if we just blow up something like a smaller Ther Therizinosaur to that size, it probably doesn't capture how strange that animal was. So yeah, I, th I think we're gonna get lots of unexpected sort of, I don't wanna call them incremental, but sort of anatomical, sort of really filling out the anatomy of what some of these animals were. But in terms of big picture dinosaur stuff, I think that the more that we can learn about dinosaur metabolism, their physiology, uh, the more questions we'll be able to ask, the more powerful the science will become. All right, cool. Uh, the next question is, why didn't Allosaurus become as popular as Tyrannosaurus rex? Yeah, so I was thinking about that a bit when I was starting this out. Part of it, I think, is, is a matter of history. So when Allosaurus was named uh, you know, way back in 1877, there weren't museums like there are now. You could, you know, all these photos that I've been showing throughout this presentation of Allosaurus at museums in New York and LA and throughout Utah and elsewhere, um, that didn't really exist. You had the first mount of Hadrosaurus that was made in the 19th century, like the first non-avian dinosaur to be mounted. There's a little ichthyornis that um, Marsh had made up at Yale. But in general, during that time, paleontologists did not display dinosaurs to the public. The dinosaurs were not really something that was even for the public in many cases. Uh, if you go and you read a lot of books about the history of paleontology during the 19th century, it was really fossil mammals that seemed to capture a lot of the public's attention. And there was a sense that with dinosaurs and other fossil animals, this was like the eggheads trying to, you know, push education on public who didn't really care. Like the dinomania that we're familiar with now just was not there. And scientists wanted to hold on to those, but say, well, I need to study this. Like, I don't want to encase it in plaster and put up on the wall because then I can't study it. It's, it doesn't help anybody. So it really took that great museum building moment of the early 20th century, where you had the American Museum of Natural History in New York and the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh and the Field Museum in Chicago, among others, they're all competing with each other to have the best dinosaur display, not because they even liked dinosaurs that much. Dinosaurs are thought to be relatively useless for learning anything about evolution because there are too few of them, they were too big. It wasn't like uh, fossil horses where you can see, you know, the toes change and the, heat, the teeth change and, and the body size grow over time. We didn't have any of that for dinosaurs. So I thought they're basically the summer blockbusters of the fossil record. You can get people to buy tickets to your museum if you had a big sauropod in your dinosaur hall. But beyond that, if you really wanted to study evolution over time or say something meaningful about the fossil record, you studied fossil mammals or you studied trilobites or ammonites or something like 
that. But it was during this time, basically box office dinosaurs, that you had the discovery of Tyrannosaurus rex during this time museum building. And at the time, during its initial description, it was thought to basically be just a continuation of what Allosaurus was already doing, that this is an animal that, you know, it seemed bulkier, it was certainly was larger, it lived at a later point in time. It was part of this Carnosaur group that paleontologists hypothesize exists, and now it's been split into all different parts of the family tree. But Tyrannosaurus was just, it had the name, it was at a famous museum, the New York Times ran a story when just the legs and the hips were mounted of Tyrannosaurus Rex. It, had, it was presented in a newspaper article in the New York Times, signed the prize fighter of antiquity. Part of this had to do with um, Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was a terrible racist and eugenicist and has a, like, a pretty awful legacy in paleontology. And that relates to Tyrannosaurus and that like he saw sort of the development, he called it um, aristogenesis, this idea of things getting better and more refined over time. So T-Rex was in a way a kind of example of this internal urge that he thought existed in evolution that the most fierce and the biggest and most impressive would obviously win out. So all that stuff was coming together. And by then Allosaurus was old news. And you know, there were skeletal mounts made, but really Allosaurus was only used to highlight how big Tyrannosaurus was. And I mean, Allosaurus has had a couple of shots at the big time. You got Valley of Guanji, which is you know, a, a fun movie to watch. It's you know, shown up in a couple other you know, films uh, over time before T-Rex you know, really rose to um, the top level of celebrity that it did. But really, I think T-Rex were, were that first big push of um, you know, interest and fascination with dinosaurs. That was the biggest and the baddest one. And, and we see this today, right? Like that, uh, I think it was like Carnivora Forum years ago. And I was saying, uh, how many people have had arguments on the internet about whether T-Rex or Spinosaurus is bigger? Who would win in a fight between them? It's like, we're not trying to understand these animals in terms of um, you know, what, how they acted as animals. It's just that aspect of being the biggest, being the fiercest, having the biggest bite force and stuff. It's always going to tap into that narrative that already exists, where basically we have the sense of competition that started going back to the announcement and, and mounting of, of T-Rex has just continued since then. Well, that's uh, it's re that's really interesting, given the uh, with all the uh, the, with all the cultural context and surrounding why Tyrannosaurus just immediately shot to the top. The name probably also helped. Oh, absolutely. It's weird to think, sorry, sorry. Oh, go, go ahead, please. I was gonna say it's weird to think how much culture shapes science more than people want to admit, and how much science shapes culture more than people want to admit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, paleontology out of context isn't really anything. It, like, it, it, it's, it's a science, and science is a way of knowing. It's a process. It's a conversation. I think we often have this idea of science, and in paleontology in particular, that we go in the field or go through a museum collection, we find something new, or we make a discovery, and that's like a new fact that is known, and now it goes on the shelf somewhere, and we just move on to the next thing. Really what people study and why they study it and you know the, the sort of even just the egos in, involved in our field and there certainly are you know all this stuff plays into the science and it comes through i, I think people who say you know just let the science stand for itself let's just talk about the science as it is i don't want to talk about the historical context i don't want to talk about the politics that's being its own kind of science denialist like trying to be a science purist ends up denying a lot of what science is. And just pick an alternate example outside of our field, you see this with the myth, myth of the alpha wolf. So this idea that still you know, is perpetuated today and you'll see it in you know, books about business or hear it in conversation that like, oh, okay, wolves have like you know, an alpha pair and they mate and they prevent everybody else from mating and they really control everything everybody does. And we've known for decades that this isn't how it works. That a lot of that sort of controlling and militaristic idea of carnivore social behavior came from male naturalists who served in World War II or were somehow involved in that conflict afterwards going out into the field and when they looked at wolves and what they were doing, seeing 
militaristic tactics. They were seeing the generals sending their soldiers out to battle, coordinating things that way. They didn't think in terms of cooperation or emphasizing the sort of maternal nature of the female wolves and things like that. It was this idea of like alpha and control and stuff because of their background. And that's why diversity is so important to science because how you're raised, who you are, the things that you take in, the conversations that you have, who you work with, all of those things influences the science. It might not be direct, but it's not as if science is insulated from all of this stuff. All of that informs what we do, and even just like the nature of how we argue and the structure of science itself that we're trying to kind of deconstruct and make a better place for everybody. So I think if you want to understand dinosaurs at all, it's not just a matter of keeping on top of the latest research. You really need to understand these animals in context and why, for example, like Theropods will always have, like if you go to a theropod session at SVP, it'll be packed and it's very lively. If there's a session about like ornithopod dinosaurs, there'd be like 20 people there. That's affected by these things as well. Yeah, I remember the, I remember the fish sessions at the last SVP were almost empty. Which is really a shame because there's some amazing research in fish that's another example. Like in many cases, we have good sample sizes or we can do a lot of interesting things, compare them to modern animals and that's getting on another tangent but yeah like history and context and diversity and who we are this all informs how the science proceeds you might not be able to see it in the individual paper but when you start to step back a little bit get that bigger view and like who trained who and who came from what background and tradition like all these things start to come together yeah all right so uh uh, we don't have a donation for this, but several people in the chat are 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 curious about the uh, like. What do you think about Sorphagonax? Like, is it a species? Like, is it a different species, or is it the same thing as one of the already known species of Allosaurus? And someone also brought up Epontarius. Right. Yeah, I meant to mention um, Epontarius as, as well. This is another. Mystery dinosaur, it's kind of like for theropod people, it's like the amphicolius of theropods and that like the specimen's been lost. It's unlikely that we're gonna find it again, but this seems to be, I think it was initially described as a sauropod, but it turned out to be an allosaurus that's getting the comfort within the range of some of the largest carnivorous theropods. For sauropagonax, it's been like some people still consider it its own genus. Some people will call it allosaurus maximus. Uh, some other folks say that it's just basically like uh, an Allosaurus fragilis that grew a little bit bigger. It gets a bit complicated because from what I understand, the bones that were initially excavated to um, name that specimen, which were in uh, Oklahoma, uh, were excavated by a um, WPA group, so Work Progress Administration group, uh, in the wake of the, the Depression. So this is basically a new deal, you know, we're trying to send people to work, and some of those people were working on excavating dinosaurs. And it was great that they were doing that, but they didn't always have training. So some of those bones are not in the best condition that they could be. I think there's been other specimens that have shown up since then, but there hasn't been a synthetic study of, so for example, a couple of years ago, we had a manual shop in that group that came out with that Brontosaurus paper, saying that maybe Brontosaurus is valid again. We're gonna do a specimen level phylogeny of these dinosaurs and see how everybody relates to each other. Um, I think in terms of that argument, there's something else to, you know, that's a whole other thing, whether Brontosaurus is valid or not, but we, we're still lacking that for um, Allosaurus as, as yet and how Sorophagonax relates. Personally, I don't think it's different enough to deserve the genus level difference. I think it's, you know, at maximum, huh? it's, a, it's Allosaurus maximus. But it may just be a regional variant of Allosaurus fragilis. We really, like, the legwork still needs to be done there. But just looking at it and the sort of the features that are used, they're very subtle features of, like, tail vertebrae and things of that nature that I'm not sure that they're consistent enough to say, okay, this is basically, like, some lineage split and changed to something that's fundamentally different. So the jury is still out, but my gut feeling is that it's, it's certainly a species of Allosaurus. It's just a matter of whether this is a population variant that was drifting away or it basically falls within the variation of the animals that we already know. And that's kind of the difficulty with some of these specimens. Like I, I was mentioning how awesome it is 
that we have so many specimens of Allosaurus, but it also becomes kind of like an albatross <laughs> around you know, a worker's neck where if they want to see every specimen, study every specimen, that's a lifetime's worth of work. This is one of the reasons why we don't, for example, have a consensus on how many species of Camarasaurus there were. So probably one of the primary prey animals for Allosaurus, how many Camarasaurus species were there? Was like Camarasaurus grandus, like the largest one, actually its own big species, or is this just kind of the end of the growth curve? And that's because it's so common and there are so many that it's this monumental task to actually do this. I hope somebody undertakes it or a team of researchers over time does. But in terms of some of these systematic questions, yes, it still needs to be resolved. All right. We have uh, another question about uh, dinosaur social dynamics, which were mentioned uh, earlier. What do you think mm -hmm. is the most likely given what we do know? So in terms of what we know about Allosaurus, unfortunately, we don't know a whole lot. Um, I think Cleveland Lloyd might, if we can ever crack that case, that might tell us something. It would be wonderful if we found eggs there, um, because that might tell us something. Like one egg was found, it was described in the 1970s. Um, I think it's described in science in just a short communication, like dinosaur egg found in Utah. <laughs> but it was the first Allosaurus egg that we really knew about. It's what allowed this correlation in the state of Wyoming. The problem with Cleveland Lloyd is that it's a quarry that's been worked by so many different crews, crews from Princeton and Brigham Young University and the University of Utah and the University of Wisconsin and others. There have been, you know, Boy Scout troops and other uh, community groups that have been allowed in some of the quarries over time to dig around a bit. Like, in a way, we kind of need a brand new excavation because there are rumors that there were eggs there that were destroyed in previous excavations because they didn't, they didn't know that they were looking for. Um, these, you know, during some of the historic excavations, things like whole sauropod ribs were destroyed because just like who needs another sauropod rib was, was the logic. So Joe Peterson and his group have been doing some of that systematic new excavation, but I'd be really fascinated to see if we could push beyond where the existing quarry is. You can go see it, you can go drive up to it. It's a um, part of Jurassic National Monument now, so you can see the historic quarry and where the extent of it was. But those bones go back in the hill. We have is going to the hill behind the main quarry. There's still a bone coming out of it. So we know that, you know, despite the fact that we have like dozens of allosaurus that we know about based upon the number of left femora, and there are probably hundreds of animals in this deposit that have been excavated, that the bone bed continues for quite a ways. And maybe in those sections, there's something that can give us a clue as to why these animals are congregating. A clue might come from, you know, if the courtship and reproduction aspect is correct, from uh, trace fossils that were described just a couple of years ago in places in Colorado and elsewhere. Uh, they're early Cretaceous, if I remember correctly, in age, but that these are basically these huge fields. They're, they're like lex. They're like uh, sage grouse lex. There are areas where these allosaur-type dinosaurs were coming in a scratch in the ground. It seems to be a courtship behavior very similar to what some modern avian dinosaurs do. So if we could find something like that, if we can find a field of trace fossils, if we could find some evidence of eggs, that might say something, at least in this instance, about why they're coming together. Another example might be um, trackways. If we can find some good Allosaurus trackways between multiple individuals walking together on the same bedding plane in the same direction, even interacting with each other, uh, that would go a long way. And it's possible it's out there. There are Morrison age dinosaur track sites you know, in that area. Um, you know, maybe they just have, haven't been found yet or haven't been studied quite yet. So I think for the social dynamics of Allosaurus, like far more is unknown than known. Uh, I, given how common it was, uh, it's possible that they were gregarious in, in some respect, just because it's hard for me to envision if these were sort of the leopards or the tigers of their time, how much space an individual animal would need and it seems like their abundance is far too high for that. I mean, that's one of the lines of logic that we use for the La Brea asphalt seeps and that dire wolves or pack hunters. We don't have great direct evidence of dire wolves or pack hunters, but because they're so overrepresented there, it seems that something different is going on and we can make that sort of connection. So there's lots of stuff that we need to find, lots of hypotheses that need to test, but I, I have a gut feeling that Allosaurus had some sort of 
social structure for at least part of its life, whether it was learning from his parents how to hunt or you had loose um, social groups or even they just tolerated each other uh, in the same habitat at a relatively high level. Um, it could entirely be like we see with Nile crocodiles today where like when they all kind of descend on a carcass together, it would seem that some of them are holding the carcass while there's feet. It seems to just be competition and it's not actually the case. So it's not intent sociology, but just kind of functionally works out. So I'd really love to know myself and I hope we get some more discoveries. About that. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see if we have any other. Oh, uh, yes, we have a, we have another question. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, so, uh, Question asks, we recently found a more basal allosaur, but the evolution of the clade is still poorly understood, as far as, far as I know. What do you think the earliest allosauroid might have looked like? So if I'm guessing correctly, this might be the asphalto venator that was found in South America. Yeah, I think that's what they're referring to. Right, yeah, it's a, a kind of middle Jurassic time period. Um, I think that good look. I know there's a little bit of debate about where that animal falls um, and then kind of rearranges some of the relationships on that part of the theropod family tree where you have the divergence of uh, the megalosaurs and the ceratosaurs and the allosaurs from each other and that megalosaurs and allosaurs might be more closely related to each other than previously thought. To me, it looks really similar to what we see uh, involving allosaurus, but is this a matter of Homoplasy is this a matter of convergent evolution because we know theropods throughout the Jurassic were really displaying a lot of different sorts of eye ornamentation. That, if that's already kind of in the genetic mix or developmental mix for possibility, similar to like ceratops of dinosaurs in Lake Cretaceous, where you have lots of different horn arrangements, but some of them start to converge even though they're in different um, lineages. It's hard to tell, but I think as things stand now, that uh, asphalto venner is probably a, a good look at what the beginning of the Allosaur lineage looked like. And I, I hope that we get a few more fossils um, to fill that in. The Middle Jurassic, right now, it feels like it's, it's wide open territory that almost any dinosaur that's found in that time period is going to tell us something new. So I hope we see more of them. Yeah, yeah, because uh, the Middle Jurassic is, in, in many places, just this void. Where we barely have any, where we barely have anything. So, I look. So I look forward to what that could tell us. Even in the early Jurassic, even out here, you know, we have a lot of early Jurassic exposures. Um, if you go to Moab, Utah, they're all they surround you. They're all over the place. But it's primarily these dune faces that preserve tracks, almost nothing else. So that we know mid-sized to getting a little bit larger theropods were there. We know that this was during a time period where theropods were evolving more headgear. It's the same time period as like Dilophosaurus, for example, and uh, Coelophosaurus and stuff had a little bit of ornamentation. So really even going back into the earlier days of the Jurassic, I wonder if we're going to start to pick up on some of these lineages, some of the changes. Because if you look at um, those early Jurassic sandstones, even the American Southwest, they're very fossiliferous, but it's mostly traces. The amount of body fossils that we have, I think is less than 10. So almost any dinosaur that you find in those, any theropod that you find that is gonna tell you something. So really, you know, we know the Morrison super duper well, but it's those first two chapters of the Jurassic, the early and middle parts that we really need a clearer look at. Yeah, well, uh, thank you so much for appearing. It would, it's been, it's, uh, it was great to have you on board. Yes, thank you so much. Well, it's been a pleasure. And yeah, Retro and I are both very glad to uh, <laughs> outsource for, for a little while. And yeah, if anybody um, wants to follow up with additional questions, you can find me on Twitter at Laylaps, L-A-E-L-A-P-S. But thank you so much, both of you and everybody who's made this stream possible. It's great. And please keep donating, whether you ask questions or not. Please yes. keep supporting this cause. It's really important. Actually, on that note, actually, I wanted to announce formally that we have passed four thousand dollars in donations when we include T-shirt sales. Yay! Yay. Good. It's Yay. great. So news. exciting. Um, so thank you to everyone, and thank you, Riley. And next up, we have uh, Evan Johnson Ransom. <laughs>